In this poisonous political climate, we have to drag out, love your enemies? Jesus, are you trying to get me killed? This is what we might call a hard word. It's hard to hear and it is hard to preach. And yet there it is, plain as day, the teaching of our Lord and Savior. I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Now, what are we to do with that? This is really difficult to live up to sometimes, isn't it? Well, let's, let's back up all the way to the beginning here. This is part of Jesus' effort to call his disciples to a higher uh, standard than simply following the rules. We have to, to go above and beyond the law, just like we heard last week. You know, it was, last week it was about getting along with uh, people that you know. So, you know, um, reconcile with your brother if you have a difference with them. Um, don't quarrel, don't fight, don't throw your spouse away. This week the focus turns outward for the most part and the standard gets higher, outrageously higher. First, uh, first, Jesus talks about what we call the, the lex talionis, which is the, uh, the law of retaliation. That's the, the principle that the punishment should not exceed the crime. So, let's say, and why not, that I come over and I gouge your eye as part of the sermon. Mary's glad that she's no longer up front. <laughs> You know, not just a sermon illustration, no big deal, right? Well, the point of uh, the law of uh, retribution is that if I, let's say, and why not, gouge your eye out, you don't get to kill me. The maximum punishment is that I lose my eye. Same with the tooth, right? Same if somebody hits you. But again, Jesus wants his disciples to go above and beyond. So if somebody hits your cheek, that, uh, which was, uh, in those days, it was an insult, it was a punishable offense. The, uh, the idea here is that um, they talk about hitting someone with the back of the hand on the, on the right cheek. So that's sort of an insult. Disrespectful. And you could be punished for that in Jewish law. But Jesus says, if somebody does that to you, just turn around and walk away. You don't have to get into that tit-for-tat cycle of violence and retribution. You can break it and just be yourself. And if somebody wants to take your coat, well, give them your, uh, your uh, cloak as well. Now, I understand that the, the coat um, the, the heavy outer layer, that was often the only thing of any real value that uh, people would uh, own. And so it was the sort of thing that uh, you would give in collateral for a loan. So if you don't repay the loan and somebody takes you to court and they say, I'm just going to keep your coat, then you say, here, have my cloak. That's the undershirt. That's the only thing uh, between you and going sky clad, as they say, naked. You just say, here, take this too. Go above and beyond what the law requires, even if it requires you to walk around naked. That's a pretty high standard to meet, isn't it? I'm seeing some people here saying, I think I'll just pay the bill instead. <laughs> it is Wisconsin. I mean, we've got good reasons not to want to, to do this. 
And if somebody forces you into service, do them one better. Double what they ask of you and do it willingly. And if somebody wants to borrow from you, give them the money. If somebody begs from you, give them the money. <coughs> Just do it. All of this seems difficult, if not impossible, to carry out in practice. You know, people are naturally uh, reluctant uh, to do it. They see threats that, uh, that they want to counter. I need to protect myself. I need to protect other people. I can't just give in to this kind of stuff. Right? We don't want to give in to it. We don't want to be vulnerable. We don't want to be defenseless. There's a couple of theories about what's going on. One is that uh, Jesus is essentially telling his disciples, uh, kill them with kindness. Or as Paul says, if you do kindness to someone who does evil to you, you heap burning coals on their head. Or maybe this is all deliberate exaggeration to get people thinking about what their actual duty is. I can't possibly do this. I can't possibly walk away from somebody hitting me in the face. So what am I supposed to do? But there's a third possibility worth considering. There's at least one scholar who, uh, who sees signs that all of these, uh, these lessons uh, take place against the backdrop of uh, Roman military occupation. That these are actually, this is actually Jesus talking about how his disciples should relate to the Romans. That bit about going the extra mile? Well, Jesus uses the Latin word milius, where we get mile from, he uses that rather than the more familiar Greek term. So he's cluing his readers in, we're talking about the Romans here, folks. And that thing about uh, asking people to go a mile, that's something that the Roman soldiers would do to civilians. I got this crap that has to get over there, you're going to pick it up and move it. Same thing that happens to Simon of Cyrene when he, uh, he's told to carry the cross for Jesus. So who do you think he's talking about? Who do you think the enemy is, anyway? It's those Romans. Even in Jesus' day, there was a debate about how to respond to the Roman presence in Israel. Some people advocated a violent rebellion <coughs> against them. And eventually those people, about the time that Matthew's uh, gospel was written, those people go ahead with their violent rebellion, and you know what happens to them? I'll give you three guesses. <laughs> What's that? Got snuffed out. They got snuffed out. They sure did. They all got killed. Jesus sees those kinds of arguments and he says, you know what? That's not the right way. That's just going to get everybody killed. So he offers a, <coughs> excuse me, another alternative. Not violence, but something like subversion. Right? Because as we have seen in countless nonviolent protests um, since his day, when you stick to what is right in the, in the face of oppression, you call attention to the injustice being done to you. Remember the lunch counter sit-ins in the civil rights era? Right? When people would come and they would pour coffee and milk and whatever on people's heads and try to get them to lash out? By just sitting there and ignoring it, they put the focus on the wrong rather than getting into that cycle of violence against them. And let me tell you, they had to train hard to learn to do that, to overcome the natural instinct to uh, rebel, to fight back. 
and there are stories about the, uh, the civil rights movement and how they would train people to go out on these protests and not uh, lash out. And they were brutal. I mean, these trainings were awful. And they had a lot of people who just broke and couldn't do it. And they'd say, sorry, you're not going to the protest. Right? You had to be able to sit there and take it to keep the focus on the other folks. This is an excellent way for people who don't have any power to overcome injustice. You can't fight back, so you find another way to meet your aims, nonviolent ways. Still, love your enemy? I mean, really? Now, understand this. Love and hate here um, aren't primarily about emotions. They're about duty. Um, we have a uh, we have edicts from kings in Jesus' day and earlier where they command their subjects to love them. And that's not, uh, that's not holding a, a rally to get people to support you. That's saying, do your job. I'm the king. Pay your taxes. Obey the law. Love me. So it's possible that what Jesus is saying is do the right thing always, even for people that you would consider your enemy. And that includes praying for them. You know, I, I included this scripture um, at our 9-11 memorial service um, back in 2001. And boy, didn't I get into hot water. <laughs> But yeah, that's the Christian message. Pray for those enemies. That means see them as God sees them. Resist the temptation to dehumanize them. And remind yourself of all the love and grace and mercy that God has shown you. And act accordingly. Now it's important to understand that that kind of love can't be given with any hope of return. You just got to give it out there for its own sake and not expect anyone to love you back. And that points the way forward, I think, in these, these dark and partisan days. I won't give my enemies the satisfaction of hating them. Now, maybe they irritate me, but that's a sermon for another time. Instead, I will do what is right by them, including praying for them and their salvation. Not because I hope to get anything out of them, but because I have been called, and you have been called too, to be perfect, like your Father in heaven is perfect. And that begins with perfect love. Amen.